with thermochemistry. Um, oh, any issues we need to get to before I start talking? No? Okay. All right, so um, we, had, we had left off talking about um, how to determine the enthalpy of a reaction based upon the individual enthalpies of the reactants and products. And that's what this slide is about. Um, we also had seen that uh, enthalpy and Q, the heat transfer, uh, are not necessarily the same thing. Whereas Q is a path function, it does depend on what route was taken to get from one place to another. Enthalpy is not. Enthalpy is a state function. But there is but one condition that we've studied so far uh, in which they are equal numerically and units measure too. That is delta H is equal to Q if the process occurs under constant pressure. So if, if as long as you hold the pressure constant um, during the process, you can equate the Q with the delta H. And the delta and the Q is the one that you measure because Q is dependent upon uh, transfer of heat based upon difference in temperature. So if you see a change in temperature, then you can relate that to a movement of heat. And that's another way to look at it also. Heat requires movement of energy, thermal energy from one place to another. Whereas delta H, enthalpy, is more along the lines of a potential. That's the potential amount of energy that can be transferred during a chemical reaction. So that's why uh, most processes that chemists study, they try to maintain the pressure, hold the pressure constant. That makes the whole, the whole experiment easier to uh, conduct if the pressure is constant. Now, if we know that the... Uh, enthalpy of the products, and we can add those up and subtract the enthalpy of the reactants. And those values typically come in uh, reference manuals. Just look them up. And we'll do some problems like that where you can use that information. Okay. Um, we can also um, use thermochemistry as part of our stoichiometry. We have a balanced equation and you can follow the progress of the reaction uh, from uh, so much of a product to so much of a reactant. You can also determine how much heat was transferred in the process. And it could be transferred into the system or out of the system. Remember when, when these values are Cal uh, calculated, the sign is extremely important. If the sign is positive, that means that much heat could potentially uh, be added to the system. Everything is referenced to the system. So if the system is our reaction, and if the, if the value of delta H is positive, that means the enthalpy is into the system. And of course, the other way, if it's negative, then the enthalpy is leaving the system. Heat <coughs> is leaving the system. <clears throat> and this is typically referred to as um, exothermic. Exo meaning out of. And this is endothermic, meaning into. So with this problem, <clears throat> we have this balanced equation. And we also have this enthalpy assigned to it. And notice that in this particular slide, we've said uh, with this reaction, when this reaction occurs, if there is one mole of propane that undergoes this reaction, it goes from here to products then we should expect uh, 2,221 
kilojoules of energy to be evolved. It's exothermic because it's negative. So that's for one mole of propane. But you can also look at this equation. Um, in the reference manuals, you won't see that down here. You'll just see kilojoules or joules, whatever the case may be. You won't see this subscript. This was placed in here to reference one mole of propane because of the way the question is structured. And I'll get to that in just a second. But <clears throat> if the stoichiometry is based upon oxygen, so you have so many grams of oxygen that react and uh, completely converted, reacting that many grams of oxygen over here, then we interpret this in terms of this many kilojoules per five moles of oxygen. Or you could say this many kilojoules per three moles of carbon dioxide produced. Okay, so this is referenced to the entire balanced equation. That means if you are actually reacting two moles of propane, then you should have double the amount. Another reason I hate Windows 10. <clears throat> and if you triple it, you just triple this amount. So the, the uh, multiplier that you may be using here is in terms of the entire reaction. And if you have three times this and not three times that. Okay. But if you are basing it on one mole of carbon dioxide, then it, this value would be one third. See what I'm getting at? Coefficients mean everything referenced to the end value. Now let's do a, a, a stoichiometry problem with this one. Uh, let's assume that we can we burn the propane in excess oxygen. We've got plenty of oxygen, it's not limiting. So we're going to consume all the propane. And if we um, burn five grams of propane, how much heat should we expect to produce as a product of that reaction? Let's see, do I have that, uh, that part of the slide? Yeah, it's not very well explained, so let me put it on the board. There's our propane reacted with this much oxygen. And it gives us that much CO2 and this much water. Okay. So we're given five grams here of that, and this is excess. So all we have to worry about is this one. Right. If this one is converted completely, then how much heat should we expect? So since this uh, amount of enthalpy is Reference to one mole here, we need to find out how many moles that is. Right. So you all know how to do that. Convert grams to moles, you need molar mass, correct? So the molar mass of propane is what? Let's see if it's already figured in here. 44.11. Grams per mole of propane equals five. Okay, so that'll tell us how many moles of propane we have, and then we can use that to find out how much heat, and we can expect uh, 0 0.1134. That's how many moles of propane are being burned. And yes, we did keep an extra digit. We're only allowed three, but in this calculation, we're gonna keep four just to avoid rounding errors. And we'll round our answer to three. So to convert this to enthalpy, this is our conversion factor. The enthalpy is actually a conversion factor. So we want minus two, 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 one kilojoules Per mole 
of propane. Okay. So now, uh, originally, this one canceled, give us moles. Now the moles cancel and give us kilojoules. So 0.1 times 221, and that should be in the neighborhood of about two, 240, minus 240. And I missed it, minus 252. Minus 252 kilojoules is how much heat would be produced by burning five grams of propane. Okay. And there are the calculations in animated form. So it's important if you're going to use this method to, you can select this part based upon the balanced equation. If we were converting so many grams of carbon dioxide here, we would have a different value there. We'd get a different number of moles of carbon dioxide. And then this would be ratioed to three moles of carbon dioxide. As your, uh, your uh, conversion factor. Okay. All right, now we come to the, the topic that we're interested in for today's lab, calorimetry. Calor comes from the Latin name E, and metric, of course, to measure. So calorimetry is actually the measurement of E transfer. <clears throat> in order to do that, we need uh, a set of reliable mathematics, because that's what it is. You're keeping track of where the heat's moving, how it's moving, and it depends upon both how much of the material is being measured in addition to the temperature and characteristics of the material. They differ from one to the other. You ever seen those uh, uh, videos <clears throat> Uh, those uh, ceramic bricks. About the one I saw was about like this. That on all sides, it's like a, it's a cube. <clears throat> they take a blowtorch and they heat it up till it's red hot. <clears throat> and then somebody comes in with the bare hands and grabs it by the corners and just picks it up. Why is that? Well, it can get very hot. Right? Evidence by the glowing. It's really hot, but there's not much heat there. Right? Uh, if there was a lot of heat there, then burn the guy's fingers off. But there's practically no heat there. What that means is that ceramic brick has very low heat capacity, which means <clears throat> it only takes a little bit of heat to change the temperature a lot, which it does because we know it, we see it glowing. <clears throat> Whereas with water, it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature of water. <clears throat> I mean, you just stand there and watch water sitting on your stove and watch it, watch it for it to boil. But you stand there for a while. <clears throat> <clears throat> so there's a difference in materials and the way they respond to heat transfer and measurement of temperature. And that we call heat capacity. So, in, in fact, that's even before we get to specific, the heat capacity is the amount of heat that can be absorbed for a change of one degree Celsius. So, it can have units of joules per degree C. It can hold so much heat per degree C. And this depends on how much you have. If you have a lot of material, then it'll, it'll take uh, more heat to change the temperature. If you have a little material, it'll take less heat. Right? So this, this is one of those ratios which is actually uh, an extensive property, a capacity factor. It changes with the amount of material. 
So we introduce a factor in there that will uh, turn it into an intrinsic factor, intrinsic uh, property. And we introduce uh, for a specific heat capacity, we introduce mass. So here, it'll, it'll um, absorb so much heat for each gram to produce a degree Celsius change. There's the difference. This turns this um, extensive property into an intensive property. So now it doesn't matter how much you have based upon this value. This is just, this is characteristic of the material. So water will have one specific heat capacity. Iron will have a different one, which is about a tenth of what water is. And that ceramic block would have probably a thousandth or a ten thousandth of water. <clears throat> and there's a number associated with it. These are just the units of measure. There's a number that depends upon the material itself. What it's made of. Uh, sometimes, in, rather than using grams here, um, we are in, more interested in uh, how much heat it takes to change one degree Celsius per mole rather than grams per mole. And then we call that molar heat capacity. Okay. And it will be joules per mole degree C. So you, you're going to experience or be introduced to both times, both types of heat capacity in the lab today. This is useful when you're doing calculations, when you're doing stoichiometry, also in addition to, to uh, calorimetry. Okay, so how do we use those values? Let's see, we've got a, let me check my hard copy slide. So I'm not stepping on myself. Stealing my own thunder. Uh, okay, I got a video coming up. Okay, we'll watch the video first. And I'll do like I did. Let's see, is this the first video we've seen? Did we see one? Yeah, we saw Professor Dave last time. He did, he did a video. We got another one coming up. Should say okay. And I'll do the same thing with this one. Uh, this recording, as I did with the other one, I'll take the, the original video and slip it in there so that we don't get degraded performance from recording a recording. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see, we need to look at this one. If two reactants at the same temperature are mixed and the resulting solution gets warmer, this means the reaction taking place is exothermic. <coughs> well, let's turn it heats up. An endothermic reaction then will cool down. And we're going to do both types of those in the lab today, both an endothermic and an exothermic type reaction. Okay, let's see what Professor Dave has to say. Hey, it's Professor Dave. Let's talk about calorimetry. He knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. Different substances absorb heat at different rates due to various structural factors. The heat capacity of a substance is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of that sample by one degree Celsius. A variation of this that is more useful for calculations is the specific heat of a substance, which is the energy required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Heat, temperature, and heat capacity are all related by the following equations. The amount of heat exchanged in a reaction is equal to the heat capacity of the substance times the change in temperature for that substance, 
or more practically, the heat exchanged is equal to the specific heat of the substance times the grams of the substance present times the change in temperature. We can use this information to learn about heat transfer using a process called calorimetry. For those of you in an introductory chemistry course, you'll probably do some variation of a coffee cup calorimeter experiment. Let's look at how those work. A coffee cup is a pretty good insulator. That's why we use it for coffee, so that the heat doesn't escape so quickly and the coffee stays hot for longer. This makes it possible to take pretty reasonable data about the temperature change in a cup of water when we add a hot piece of metal. We can measure the temperature change in the water and use that information to calculate the specific heat of the metal. So, let's say you heat up a metal by placing it in boiling water at a known temperature until it is just as hot as the water. Then, with tongs, you place it in a coffee cup containing a known volume of room temperature water with a thermometer. The water in the cup will heat up slightly as the heat from the metal flows into the water, and we can record the resulting temperature change. From there, we just do some math. We use the specific heat equation and plug in the data for the water. The temperature change is what you recorded. The mass of water in grams is equal to the number of milliliters of water. And the specific heat of water is a known value. This allows us to calculate the heat absorbed by the water. Well, the heat absorbed by the water was the heat released by the metal. So we can take that same quantity of heat and plug it into a new equation for the metal. That value goes there. We weighed the metal beforehand, and this time the temperature change of the metal is from the boiling water to the final temperature in the coffee cup. So you can solve for the specific heat of the metal. This is useful for identifying unknown metals if you are given a few different specific heats and asked to decipher which metal you are given. Let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys, subscribe to my channel for more tutorials, and as always, feel free to email me, professordaveexplains at gmail.com. His explanation for calorimetry is valid, but it's most useful where you only have one thing happening, like the metal, the hot metal is cooling down while the water heats up. But if you've got multiple uh, heat changes that are going on, then I got a better way that this is less likely to uh, cause error. Um, he did put up these two that were true. Um, I didn't identify the the heat capacity, that is not the specific, but the heat capacity, we give it a big C. And in that method that we're going to do today in the lab, this is the one that you're going to determine for the calorimeter itself. Okay. And this one is the one you're going to use for the other parts of the reaction or for the other parts of the experiment. We have to do this one first because we have to account for how much heat the calorimeter either absorbs or gives up during the reaction. We have to do that first. Okay, um, this is what our calorimeter is gonna look like. It's a coffee cup calorimeter. And uh, it's designed this way so that we have two layers of styrofoam and we isolate the system from its surroundings. Remember last time we talked about three types of systems. The open system, where mass and energy can cross the barrier. 
with surroundings, between the surroundings and the system. There's the closed system, which allows energy to cross the barrier, but it does not allow matter to cross the barrier. And then the isolated system, where we restrict the system so that no matter and no energy can cross the barrier. Okay. That's the type of system we have here in our calorimeter. And we do that because we don't want any outside influences to alter the energy change that we're measuring inside the calorimeter. We want it to be isolated. So whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <coughs> And I'll, I'll show you that in mathematical terms in just a minute. Uh, okay, it's an isolated system. Heat and matter can't cross the boundary. And that means that any heat changes that occur inside this calorimeter must all add to zero. Right? We're not adding anything to the system. We're not taking anything away from the system. Right? Its internal energy is constant. So that means that zero is equal to whatever happens inside you might get uh, one process is equal to uh, a heat transfer of q and this can happen inside the system that's okay it's just that all of them that we add together have to equal zero so let's say this one is for the calorimeter we're going to account for how the calorimeter interacts with the whatever we're doing inside. So we got that factor. And then we have another one. This one might be, say we're conducting our experiment like, like the example, Professor Day's example in water. So this would be the heat change for water. And then this one might be, um, three might be a heat change for uh, the metal. Okay. So that, that system has three heat transfers that we're tracking. So for this one, that Q is equal to, remember, C times change in temperature. Okay. So we can put C here times uh, change in temperature. Now the change in temperature may be different for each one. In fact, it probably will be. So that's why I gave it a, a, a subscript. Then we add together what happens to the water. Well, for the water, we need a specific heat capacity. S for water. And then we need to know the mass of the water. And then we need to know its heat change. I mean, temperature change. So that would be um, S the water, mass of the water, and temperature change for the water. Okay? And then for this one, we'll have a similar setup to that one, but this would be the specific heat capacity for the metal times the mass of the metal. See, I should put water here. And then times the temperature change for the water. Okay? That set up like this, you can have as many factors as you want or as you need to solve the problem. You don't have to keep track of, well, if this happens, what's it equal to? Oh, uh, give me a headache. Just fill it in like this, and you let the math do the work, the heavy lifting for you. Okay, so um, I'll make a point of the temperature change. Delta T is always final temperature minus initial temperature. So if the initial temperature starts out low and ends up high, this will be a positive number. But if the temperature starts out high and ends up low, like the hot metal, then this will be a negative value. That's where you get things to even out because the positive equals the negative, And that's where the zero comes. Okay, then you'll usually have one of these terms that's the unknown and you solve for it. Okay, we'll do an example.
Okay, so there's your 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 basic um, Q calculation when you need specific heat capacity. Now, if we're using moles instead of grams, you just substitute your little n in here for the moles. And then the S then has to be in terms of moles because you've got to be able to cancel those units. <coughs> All right. So let's start off slow again. Try some, uh, develop some intuition about calorimetry. If we have 100 grams of water at 90 degrees Celsius, and we have 100 grams of water at 10 degrees Celsius, what would you expect the temperature to be when they come to equilibrium? Mix them together. Right? You've got the same substance, and you got the same mass. So I would expect them to meet exactly in the middle. 90 plus 10 is 100 divided by 2 is 50. They ought to be right on 50 degrees with this scenario. Okay. That should be the final temperature for that. That experiment. Okay. Let's change the conditions a little bit. We've still got water. That hasn't changed. But now we've got 100 grams of the 90 degree, and we got 500 grams of the 10 degree. So are they going to meet in the middle? No. Since they're the same substance, they're starting at the same temperatures, but you've got more of the 10 degree. So I would expect the temperature to be less than 50. Somewhere between 10 and 50. Now, can we calculate what that temperature actually is? That's a rhetorical question. Of course we can. So we set up our equation here. So we have the heat associated with, excuse me, the heat associated with the uh, hot water plus the heat associated with cold water. And in this scenario, we're going to ignore the calorimeter. I said calorimeter is perfect. It doesn't absorb heat. It doesn't give up heat. So if we set up our calculation here. This Q is S mass delta T, and this one is S mass delta T. So what's the specific heat for uh, water? I think from the Professor Dave's slide, it was 4.18. Six is it? It's four point one eight six. Four point one eight six. What is that? Joules per gram degree C. Okay, it'd be the same for both of them. The mass for the hot water is what? One hundred grams, right? One hundred. How about the delta T? What's the final temperature of the hot water? We don't know. That's the unknown. Final temperature. The initial temperature is 90 degrees. Okay. Now we can do the cold water. It's going to have the same S value. I'm going to leave the, the units off because I'm running out of room. This one is 500 grams. And then its final temperature is the same as the final temperature for the hot water. But it starts at a different temperature. 10 degrees. Okay, so now we've got it set up. We just need to solve, solve the problem. So let's say, uh, since we've got to multiply all this times this term, let's find out what this is. Well, 100 times that is what? 418.6, correct? And that the grams already cancel here. So we've got joules per degree C. Okay, how about this one? 500 times 4.16. 186, excuse me. I get uh, 2093. This. And that also is uh, joules 
current degree C. Okay. Now we can expand it further and say this one times that one, TF, and then this one times that. So 418.6 times a negative 90. Is negative three seven six seven four, right. and that's going to be um, joules, right? Because the degree C cancel there. Okay, um, what's this one? It's this times that. 2093 TF minus 10 times this, which would be 20930. Okay, is that right? That's a minus. That's a minus. That's a minus. That's a plus. That's a minus. That's a plus. Checking all the signs. Okay, now what can we do? We can combine these two right, with the same unknown together. So we have 418.6 and then add 2093. So that's 2511.6. We just hang on to all our decimals for now times TF. And then minus this term. Yeah, I better do it part way. Six, seven, four. Three, seven, six, seven, four. And then two, oh, nine, three, zero. So I get five, eight, six, zero, four. There. Okay. Now, if we move this one over here, the sign becomes positive, correct? I put this one over here, it's positive, and then we can divide it by this one, and that will be equal to the temperature. So we're saying 58604 divided by 2511.6 is equal to the temperature. Nugget, uh, let's see. What am I allowed? Two significant figures. Yeah, two significant figures. So uh, it's uh, 23. Rounded off, 23 degrees C. Okay, that's the final temperature. And we speculated that it would be less than 50, between 10 and 50. Okay, that's how you solve a calorimetry problem. Using my isolated system formula. <clears throat> okay. Um, we can do the same thing with this one, right? In this case, now we have 50 grams of water at this temperature, and we put a 50 gram iron ball at a higher temperature. And now they have different specific heat capacities that we need to include. This would be like water, and this would be the iron ball. We'd have a different value there. And we want to determine the final temperature. And we set it up the same way, except we use different value here and different masses and maybe initial temperatures might be different. Well, initial temperatures for the iron ball would be 90 degrees and for water would be 10 degrees. <clears throat> so where should the, the final temperature be? Well, look what the side, they're the same mass. But the iron ball doesn't have as much heat in it because its specific heat is about a tenth of water. So it actually ought to be closer to the water temperature. You know, it ought to be between 10 and 50 because water has the higher heat capacity. So when you put them together, um, water is going to change less than the iron ball will. 
And if you go through the same calculation, you find that the final temperature is 18 degrees. Okay. So when we mixed water together, we actually had a greater effect from the hot water than we do from the hot iron ball. Simply because the iron ball, even though it was the same temperature as the water in our previous example, it didn't have as much heat in it because it has a lower heat capacity. And that's why we ended up with a temperature that was lower, closer to the 10 degree water. Okay. All right. Now, suppose we're going to leave calorimetry for a few minutes. Suppose um, you just maybe you pull out of thin air some reaction, some chemical reaction that you want to investigate. Um, but for some reason, you don't want to actually perform the experiment. You want to know how much heat it's likely to produce or to absorb, but maybe it's too expensive. You know, your company or your, your college won't put the bill for the materials, but you still are interested in what the enthalpy of that reaction is. Are you stuck? Probably not. And you, you owe the fact that you can calculate that expected enthalpy from Herr Hess. Hess's law says that since enthalpy is a state function, it doesn't matter how many steps it takes to get there. You can add up two, three, four, five different equations. As long as those equations added together equal your target. The one you're interested in. If you can add all those up to this one, then you can also add up their enthalpies and determine the enthalpy of your reaction. That, in a nutshell, is Hess's law. And it's based upon the fact that enthalpy is a state function. You can take go anywhere you want to, you end up back at the same place. Okay. Um, so that was one scenario. Maybe it's too expensive or you're, you don't have the facilities for it. The other reason might be before you conduct this reaction, you want to know, is it dangerous? Is it one of those reactions that produces a lot of heat? Like, um, I don't know, nitroglycerin. You want to find out what's the enthalpy of nitroglycerin before you actually do the experiment. Because if you find out that it's, um, you know, 25,000 kilojoules for the reaction, then maybe you want to scale it down a little bit. So it only produces a little bit of heat uh, for your study purposes. So for safety reasons, you may want to know in advance whether this is a particularly violent exothermic reaction. <clears throat> and you can do that with Hess's law you can uh, produce a value for enthalpy without having to do the reaction. Perform, you don't have to perform the reaction um, in your lab to learn the hard way, whether it's a particularly violent reaction. Oh, here we go again. Professor Dave here. I want to tell you about Hess's Law. He knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. Thermochemical equations can be manipulated to give important data about chemical reactions. We can use them to predict exactly how much energy will be absorbed or released by a reaction, which is very important because we don't want any unexpected explosions. There are two ways we can use tabulated thermochemical data to calculate the delta H of any reaction. The first way requires that we manipulate thermochemical equations in specific ways. So let's be aware of some rules. First, if a reaction has a particular delta H, the reverse of the reaction will have the opposite delta H or the same number with reversed sign. Second, 
if molar quantities in the equation are multiplied by a coefficient, so is the delta H. So if you double all the substances, double the delta H. These are things we can do to thermochemical data to be able to add equations together to result in a reaction we are curious about. Here's what I mean. Let's say we want to know about the change in enthalpy associated with a reaction, like this one. But it is difficult to measure experimentally. We can take other reactions with known enthalpy changes and rearrange them to align with our equation and get the data we want. The first reaction provided has carbon graphite on the left, which is where we want it. But the equation we want has two moles of graphite, so let's double this one. We get two moles of everything instead of one, and we double the delta H. Next, this other one has CO on the right, where we want it, and in the right amount. So all we need to do is add these equations together. The O2 and CO2 will cancel because they are present in the same amounts on both sides, and we are left with the substances in our original equation. Since we added the equations, we also add the delta H's to get the delta H for our equation. This kind of manipulation is allowed by Hess's law. We can manipulate the coefficients of a reaction or reverse its direction in any way necessary as long as we change the delta H associated with it in the appropriate way. Then we add or subtract the equations as necessary to give us precisely the equation in question. The delta H you get by doing the arithmetic will be the delta H for the reaction. Another way to calculate an unknown delta H is to use standard enthalpies of formation. This is denoted by the following symbol, and it represents the enthalpy associated with forming one mole of a substance from its respective elements in their standard and most stable state. Most stable state means the most common allotrope, or physical form, of an element. So carbon graphite instead of diamond, diatomic oxygen instead of ozone, and so forth. Standard state just refers to standard temperature and pressure, which is room temperature and atmospheric pressure at sea level. That's what is meant by the degree symbol. We can calculate the change in enthalpy for a reaction by adding up the standard heats of formation of the products and then subtracting the sum of the standard heats of formation of the reactants. The heats of formation can be found in your textbook or online, and you just plug them in, multiplying each value by the coefficients in the balanced equation. Let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys, subscribe to my channel for more tutorials, and as always, feel free to email me, professordaveexplains at gmail.com. Um, we'll come back to the uh, standard heats of formation in a minute, but I want to look uh, at Hess's law one more time. Um, if this is the target reaction, and we've done this experiment in the lab, and we find out that for this experiment, it's uh, endothermic. It takes 68 kilojoules for that reaction to proceed. proceed. By the way, um, and a useful way of thinking of these reactions and the heats that are involved is to write the balanced equation and then say, um, consider the enthalpy as either a product or a reactant. 
you do it that way, then if it's a positive number, it's a reactant. In other words, it's going into the system. So it would be 68 kilojoules plus this plus this and yields this. So where'd that energy go? It's stored in the bonds of this compound. It's an endothermic reaction stored in those bonds. An exothermic reaction, if it were a negative number, then that would be over here. It would produce that excess amount of energy because the energy stored in these bonds over here is greater than the energy of the product bonds. And that energy is given up as heat. Okay? So um, if we use these two equations, and these are the known uh, enthalpies for this equation and that equation, and we want to add them together, see if they, the first thing is that you have to be able to add those equations together and get exactly your target equation. Right? Until you can do that, then you cannot add these together. You got to make sure that this and any manipulations you do to those equations transfer uh, into the enthalpies as well. Then once you've proven that adding these two equations gives you the target here, then you can add them together and you end up with the same value that was determined in the laboratory. This just illustrates the fact that it doesn't matter how you got there. I go up and down several times. Path doesn't matter for enthalpies. Okay, and these are just the rules that Professor Day gave. They're just in print right here, so you can look at them later if you want. Reverse a reaction, change the sign. Uh, multiply the whole equation through by a, a constant value, even a fraction. Then you multiply that same number times the enthalpy. Okay, um, here's a set of equations that we want to calculate the enthalpy for this reaction based upon these two. And in order to do that, we've got to be sure, first of all, that we have the reactants and products on the right side, right? which means you may have to flip an equation and then in the right amount. And if we do that, um, actually it's better to work backwards. In other words, say, what do you have over here? Well, let's see, I need ammonia on this side, but it's on this side here. So that one has to be flipped. Plus, I need four ammonias. So you're gonna have to flip it and multiply it by four. And change the sign here and multiply that by four. And this one, uh, you need water on the left-hand side. Right? So you flip this one, and you have to multiply it by three, right? Because you got two here, but you need six. So you need to flip this one and multiply it by three. And that's what the next slide should. Let's see, eventually. There we go. So we flip this one already, multiply by four. We flip that one, multiply it by three. And then we can add those together. Cancel the, cancel the units that are on either side of the arrows. This is on the left-hand side of the arrow, and this is on the right-hand side. They cancel and leave us with these reactants and products in the proper position. Now we can add up our enthalpies, okay? All right, standard enthalpy formation. What does that mean? <clears throat> uh, Professor Dave mentioned Standard conditions, standard temperature and pressure. So it's not just standard temperature and pressure. We'll start there. Standard temperature, he said it was room temperature, actually is 25 degrees Celsius. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. Also, if your reaction involves solutions, then the solutions are calculated at one molar concentration. Okay? All right, those are the standard conditions. Now, what do we mean by delta H? Delta H, little zero, sub F. 
standard heat of formation. The standard heat of formation is the amount of heat that you have to supply or is given up when elements form the compound. So by definition, the elements have a standard heat of formation of zero. And the way you write it is you start with the compound, the product. Okay, so let's say we have um, uh, ammonia. That's our product. One mole of it. That's all, just one mole, and in its standard state, which would be a gas. Okay, now we work backwards to what do we form that from? Well, the elements in their standard state. So hydrogen in its standard state is diatomic gas. And nitrogen is also a diatomic gas. Okay. Now we have our elements. Next thing you have to do is to balance it. And to balance it, since you can only have one mole here, and you can't change that coefficient, then you have to use fractions here sometimes. So how many hydrogens do we have? We have three. That means we need three halves. Thank you. We need one nitrogen. So here we need one half. That's the balanced equation for the standard heat of formation for ammonia. And it will have a value associated with it. Okay? So whenever you, whenever this is called for and you have to look it up, just remember that it's based on one mole here and whatever it takes over here, coefficients, to give you that product. Uh, okay, did I put it in here? Yes, there's solution, one more word. Pure substances are easy, right? If you need to make a compound out of, uh, um, well, I don't know, iron. You would just say iron in standard state is this, and it's a solid. Or uh, whatever the case may be. I don't think we need to flog that horse anymore. Okay, That's, this is the author's idea of, of an explanation, but I don't see it helps much, except to say that. Um, this is the negative sign in front of that value. So this is probably the reactants. So they switched to put the reactants over here with their negative signs. So they'd be on the right side of the equation. But the way the equation is given in, in Professor Day's explanation and in your book is it's the sum of the heats of formation for the products minus the sum of the heats of formation for the reactants. So that's why the sign the negative sign is here. Normally we'd see these terms. Actually, you only see this term because, right, oxygen's an element. It has zero heat of formation. So these two terms would go on the other side and these two terms would come in first because they would be products. That will have a heat of formation. That one, water will have a heat of formation and methane will have a heat of formation, but oxygen will not. So to help your feelings, maybe just stick a zero in there to hold its place. Okay. Um, that's just reiterating rules. And there's your formula. That's what this sigma means. That's a, a Greek capital letter sigma. It just means summation. So you sum things together. And don't forget, with a balanced equation, the heat of formation is based upon one mole of that compound. So if you've got a coefficient in front of the, that one in the balanced equation, be sure to multiply it times that value. So that's what this means right here. Okay, for this one as an example, right? If you're gonna react sodium with water to make sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas, then you don't need values for sodium or for hydrogen. 
because they're elements of their standard state. So really, you only need to take two times sodium hydroxide, which is here, two times that value, and then subtract two times the water value here. So if you subtract a minus, it makes it a plus. And that reaction should produce negative value. Exothermic reaction should produce 368 kilojoules. Okay, the last discussion. Let's see, I've got maybe five minutes left. Okay, then we can get through this. Um, since we're talking about thermochemistry, we'll look at the world's source of energy because energy makes the world go round. Right? Well, actually, the world's been going around before we arrived. So, uh, energy makes civilization possible. How about that one? <clears throat> Without a, a cheap, concentrated source of energy, civilization will collapse. That, that's not a, an opinion, that's a fact. So, civilization started to develop using uh, common biological materials that could be burned and produce heat. Um, some societies still use them. Wood, um, some uh, dried animal bone, uh, will fire their uh, campfires and their uh, uh, cooking stoves, or whatever they use. Uh, then uh, it was discovered that before we actually used up all of our wood, it was discovered that um, there were uh, fossilized forms of energy you know, buried in the earth, you know, coal. Actually, peat was discovered, but it's, it's a very low, compared to coal, peat is is a very inefficient source of energy. <clears throat> but um, coal, natural gas, uh, oil, they're all fossilized fuels. They were stored there long ago. And now all we have to do is access them and burn them, and we get energy. And that's been, that's been fueling most of human civilization uh, in recorded history. And it will for the near future, because we still don't have a concentrated source of energy that is as uh, efficient at delivering the energy we need. Um, then came along uh, hydroelectric, right, where you, you, uh, you need water of a certain depth that's under sufficient pressure to drive turbines and uh, run your generators. Most of those sources, hydroelectric sources for at least industrial uses, have been uh, found and exploited. There, there are none left. There are some that are still available for uh, limited local access, like individuals. I, I watched this one video where this guy uh, dammed up a creek and then uh, put a, a pressure pipe at the head and ran it down the hill, you know, maybe 60 or 100 feet in height difference. And that ran into his turbine. So he developed enough pressure head from that distance to run his turbine. And that was enough energy for his house. <clears throat> but <clears throat> on an industrial scale, there are no more hydroelectric sources available. Now there's some uh, exotic sources. Like we've got uh, turbines that run on uh, uh, movements of the tides that works or uh, submerged in rivers that works but they're not plentiful enough to drive the world economy we're still stuck with fossil fuels and some nuclear nuclear ought to appeal to those who believe in uh, climate change from carbon dioxide emissions because there are no carbon dioxide emissions from nuclear So if, you, if you're interested and you run into somebody who's just wild about uh, squelching all our CO2 production, ask them how they feel about nuclear. You know, 
If they don't think nuclear will solve the problem, I mean, if they're just dead set against it, then uh, you can ignore them or call them a liar or whatever you would do. <clears throat> because they probably have an alternate agenda. That's what I'm saying. Okay, nuclear uh, is a problem for a lot of people because of accidents that have happened in the past. Three Mile Island, um, some say that it didn't uh, expose the, uh, the surrounding area to a, a nuclear uh, isotope load. Some say it did. Uh, of course, there's always Chernobyl, right? That would wreak havoc on Europe. Um, but uh, nuclear power plants, the designs available today are much, much safer. And besides, uh, we've identified fuels, right? Most, in fact, all that I know of, nuclear power plants are run on um, uranium as their power source, right? And that's not the most efficient or the safest to use. There are safer forms of nuclear of radioactive isotopes that could be used to generate nuclear power. One in particular is thorium. And thorium, in fact, is more abundant than the fissionable uranium. Plus, it will not run away if you have an accident. Big deal. It just shuts down. So, um, the problem with nuclear nowadays is one of perception, public perception, and one of government regulation. Um, I don't know what it is now, but it used to be 10 years. It took you 10 years to get through the regulatory process with the government in order to build a plan. That's before you break ground. So nobody wants to invest money and have it sit for 10 years um, waiting to get a return on their investment. Okay, those are the most common sources of energy and, and the, the mix has shifted over time. So now we're in the range where uh, petroleum and natural gas are still king. Uh, we can't get away from that. Um, renewable sources of energy just are not dense enough in energy and reliable enough in energy to fill the void. Uh, Europe just went through a, a real, real problem. They've got a bunch of wind turbines set out in the North Sea which usually is just a constant wind. It's windy all the time. But an unusual weather system came through and all their turbines shut down. And so they had blackouts and brownouts in Europe, uh, plus energy costs spike because their uh, renewable energy source wasn't renewing. <clears throat> okay, the Earth's atmosphere, what's it made of? Primarily nitrogen, and oxygen, and about 1% argon, and very minor components of other gases. The one that the, the hysterics uh, have settled on is carbon dioxide. And when you look at the effect that carbon dioxide is supposed to have on the atmosphere, you say that the Earth's surface here, and then you have the sun and radiation, is striking the earth. You know, we usually put a, that's Planck's constant and frequency means energy. Okay, if you've had physics, you know what that means. Um, but the energy comes in at one wavelength and it's absorbed by the earth, re-radiated at a longer wavelength, usually in the infrared rate region. And if we didn't have something on the surface of the earth to recapture that heat and hold it in, the Earth will turn into a snowball really quick. So a little bit of greenhouse effect is good. <clears throat> um, but what the hysterics are telling you is that carbon dioxide is responsible for heating the Earth up. Well, if you have enough of it, sure, it'll, it'll do that. Now look at Venus. I mean, Venus is hot enough on its surface to melt lead. And it's largely due to well, two things. It's... Um, about half the distance from, from the sun as we are. So it gets a lot more, four times as much solar radiation. Plus it's almost entirely carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's, it's really thick. 
there are other molecules, gas molecules in the atmosphere that are much more effective at uh, causing a greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. One of those is water. Now, intrinsically, water doesn't absorb uh, re-radiated infrared radiation as efficiently as carbon dioxide, but there are several orders of magnitude more water in the atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide. So the cumulative effect of all that water is it does create a blanket effect that helps keep the earth uh, at a stable temperature. And it has been stable for centuries. Um, so they ignore that fact. They also ignore the fact that the sun doesn't radiate the same amount of radiation all the time. It goes through cycles. Right? You've identified those cycles. You heard of the sunspot cycles every 11 years? You get a, a peak of sunspots and then they go down. When you have a lot of sunspots, there's more solar radiation striking the earth. And that will warm up the earth. And then when it goes into its dip, um, it'll cool down. It's also an interesting fact that cycle is actually a 22 year cycle because the magnetic effect reverses itself on the sun's surface. So the sunspots go through a magnetic effect this way, and then they go back down to a different magnetic effect. So you really have a cycle that goes 22 years. But during that 22 years, you get two peaks of solar radiation. Um, okay. So this is sort of a, a simplified version of uh, the greenhouse effect. What are our energy sources that we could possibly take advantage of in the future that would mitigate, or I would say mitigate global warming? I mean, it's the height of hubris, which is a Greek word for pride. It's the height of human pride to think that we can change the global, global climate. I mean, it is really big and complex. Nobody understands it. There's not a single climate model that's used today that accurately predicts change in temperature. They've all failed. Everybody. But what we can do is look to the future for alternate energy sources. It may, it may take a couple of hundred years to develop them. Right? But if we let the free market do it, you're more likely to get something that's, that's sustainable rather than government sticking its fingers in the pie. Right? What's the saying? Uh, if you want more of it, you subsidize it. This is government talking. If you want less of it, you tax it. So that's what the government does. It, it meddles in the free market with disastrous effects. <clears throat> but what are some possibilities? Right? We can modify the critics, let's put it that way. You're not gonna change the, the, the climate change. Uh, you're, gonna, you're not gonna mitigate it in any way. But we could mollify the critics. Coal gas uh, conversion, gasification, uh, reduces the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced for a, a jewel of energy. That's possible. But you also have waste. Right? Coal is not just uh, carbon. Right? It's got ash in it, too. It's got sulfur in it. It's got all those other things. Um, and that's one thing that's not talked about very much anymore. I remember for a while it was uh, coal-fired plants that are run on dirty coal that has lots of sulfur in it. They produce acid rain downwind. Now, that's a, that's a verified fact. They have acidified ponds in the northeast. Uh, it kills all the fish. And the water looks all crystal clear blue water. That's because there's nothing living in it. <laughs> Anyway, that's one possibility. Hydrogen. That's like the holy grail of uh, chemical fuels. Because if you have a plentiful source of energy to make electricity, then all you have to do is split the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. Store the hydrogen for your energy. You, know, you keep the oxygen if you want, but just blow it into the air because you're going to get it back anyway eventually when you burn the hydrogen. <clears throat> And the product of burning hydrogen is water. That's it. You can either burn it in an internal combustion engine 
You can run it through a gas turbine. Uh, you can put it through a fuel cell and get electricity directly from conversion. Um, but there are, there are issues there. Like if you're going to put it in your car, you've got to find a safe way to store it because it's flammable and it's more volatile, much more volatile than gasoline. Uh, then uh, you got to store enough of it to make uh, a road trip cannibal. Like, I don't want to have to stop three times on the way to Atlanta just to fill my hydrogen tanks. Um, all right. So, another possibility. Other alternatives. Well, we've already uh, managed to extract more energy from pre-existing um, oil and gas sites by fracking. You know, and there are people that are just dead setting against fracking too. But what it does is it, it breaks up uh, impervious uh, rock layers and allows that material to come out. And that's why, for at least for a short time, this country was a net energy exporter. And that happened during Donald Trump's presidency. Um, ethanol production from biological sources is uh, a no-win solution. It's one that's subsidized. And the only reason that it still exists and it's part of our gasoline is that the government subsidizes taking corn and converting into ethanol. It takes more energy uh, to make a gallon of ethanol than you get back when you burn it. Uh, methanol is another possibility. I don't know too much about that one. It's just a different type of alcohol. Seed oils, possibly. Uh, you'd need a diesel engine to use them efficiently. In fact, the diesel engine was invented by uh, a German, obviously. I forget his first name. His last name is Diesel. And it was originally designed to run on vegetable oil. Uh, it was only later that we converted it over to petroleum-based products. And you can still run a diesel engine on spent um, you know, when restaurants empty their fryer vats, they dump the oil out in a big tank and somebody has to come by and pump it out to haul it off. Um, lots of, they'll just give it to you for free. You have to convert your, the engine will run on it, no problem. But what you have to do is preheat it right before you inject it into your engine, your diesel engine, because if you don't, uh, that differential in temperature will cause it to gum up and it'll seize your engine. <clears throat> oh, I missed that one. Um, photovoltaics and wind, right? I already mentioned those problems. It doesn't happen reliably. And we, our battery storage technology now is not efficient enough to store enough energy during uh, bright, sunny days and windy days to bridge the gap. I think Elon Musk is trying to build uh, battery factories and huge storage sites and that's his prerogative i mean it's, as long as you let the free market work you know it's his money he spend it any way he wants to um let's see what else we have uh, well the economics are bad but also um where do these photovoltaic these uh, solar cells come from where do the wind turbines come from uh, you have to make them. That produces a lot of waste, especially because they need exotic metals. They need um, metals from this part of the table. Right here. They're very rare. Only certain places in the in the on the planet produce them, and a lot of them are in China. So you you tie yourself to uh, an unfriendly government's supply of the needed materials. Plus, what happens when they're used up, right? They have a limited life. What do you do with the waste material? Right? You, you bury it in the middle of the night so nobody knows you're doing it. That's what you do. Especially if, if this is your bread and butter project. I mean, if you're screaming at the top of your lungs for renewable sources, uh, you don't say it, but they think about the pollution that they cause. 
in production or in end of life pollution. All right. Uh, and then there's nuclear. We could solve a lot of our problems if people just get over their nuclear heebie-jeebies. Nuclear would take us well into the future. Um, and eventually, if we ever get a handle on fusion energy, that will solve everything because we've got massive quantities of the isotopes of hydrogen that we need to, uh, to supply energy from nuclear fusion. We just have to master the uh, physics and make it economical. And one thing about uh, fusion reactions is if anything goes wrong, I mean, it's, it's an active uh, management system. I mean, all you have to do is just one thing go wrong, the whole thing shuts down. That's it. I mean, there's no uh, China syndrome associated with nuclear, uh, with fusion nuclear energy. Okay. I'm down off my soapbox now.